नमस्कार मित्रों सभ्यता अध्ययन केंद्र की इस व्याख्यान श्रृंखला में आप सभी का स्वागत है हेलो मैं प्रोफेसर सुरेंद्र अपने श्री मेजर सुरेंद्र माथुर जी से अनुरोध करता हूं कि आज की गोष्ठी का प्रारंभ करें सुरेंद्र माथुर जी जी बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद Uh, I would like to introduce you to our guest speaker today from Poland. Uh, his name is Nikola Jermakowski. He is a very dynamic young scholar from Poland. Uh, he is a Slavic, and uh, they are working for the survival of their ancient uh, culture and beliefs. Slavic, as you know. Uh, are widespread in eastern europe mostly in eastern europe and i can i can say that 30 40% of europe you can count on slavics they are in poland they are in czech republic they are in uh, slovakia they are in ukraine they are in belarusia and most important that they are in russia too Croatia and many more countries they are widespread all over the eastern europe and the culture is uh, very much common with the neighboring other cultures also like a uh, lot of similarities we are finding with baltics and with also with the transylvania so you can say that eastern europe is a lot lot much connected with the slavic culture now you will be surprised to know that when you hear uh, the the cultural festivals and beliefs you can connect them with vishnu puran they may not be knowing what vishnu puran is but so many things are connected with uh, vishnu puran uh now but there are few of the gods and goddesses their names we have their names but they are common hindi uh, vocabulary but as far as they are concerned they are their gods and goddesses i will give you some examples like morona morona now morona is is a goddess which is a winter goddess and she is uh, they, they celebrate this festival morona festival which is our holy now the holy as you know we call holika dahan now dahan means you know cremation and obviously it is after that cremation is death and death we call marna so this is marna so the marna is a goddess for them and it has become a marna festival similarly there are other goddess like you know they have a cosmic tree the cosmic tree they also have you have the sky and the sky uh, we call uh, akash but we also call akash gagan why do we call gagan also i don't think uh, maybe some of the scholars know about it but they have this gagan is uh, is a, a, ki a kind of a bird which is protecting the cosmic tree so that is gagan similarly uh, they have moksha like after the death we take the body to for cremation to moksha dhama now in moksha dhama the, the person is cremated and we believe that after cremating uh, he he merges with the pancha tattva the five elements so it is mother earth so they call mother earth moksha so there are so many the swarg is is also a goddess they call swaraga so many common festivals we are finding i will name a few which is very very interesting i told you about holi and they call marana we call dahan now in marana also they have a female deity made of hair something like we make uh, holika exactly the same and the holika she is uh, decorated with uh, women clothes and there's a male also 
but that holika is then burned and thrown into a water or a or pond similarly if you uh, see the navratri we had navratri a um, month and a half back and you see every day festival is matching with them every day festival is matching like uh, during uh, this festival we we grow uh, we sow the seeds wheat seeds and we we grow jawara they also called jiva we call jawara they call jiva they call it green blood similarly on the third day we have in rajasthan we worship parvati ji ganagor they have the same festival but in a different form on the eighth day hindu families invite young girls to their home and give them food there the girls visit many many houses and they are offered with lot of fruits and many 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 things there so much common and it it is common so they have the concept of cosmic tree where there is a mount meru in the swarga you know the the uh, they have you know four gods in gods perun is one of their main god which is indra and he has a is a white horse the tree is oak tree and the underworld we have devta and danav or underworld so there's a underworld there are serpents and under the tree they have a white stone which is an altar like a shivalinga and right next to it is there is a well which has a white kind of a liquid like we go to shivalaya and offer milk so exactly the same concept so i will not go into much detail i was just trying to you a little brief how common we are how close we are it is just that since we have been separated for many many years so probably the, but the festivals the gods and goddesses everything we are finding almost same you can dicto you can say there is a fight between indra and uh, indra the swarga and danavas and same thing is happening the danavas are ruling swarga sometimes sometimes the indra takes over the swarga so same thing like vishnu puran it goes on so many times you know sometimes the danavas are ruling sometimes devtas are ruling and all those festivals are connected with this kind of uh, uh, vishnu puran with, uh, with them so i will not go more into this because i we have a very scholarly person is a very young and dynamic mikola is a very young and dynamic and uh, now we are uh, he he is in the process of uniting the all the slavics uh, from the europe and hopefully and since we found that they are very close to us they are like our brothers so he is always uh, welcome to india and he is helping us in a lot of research work so i now hand hand, hand you over to uh, mikula for his presentation thank you namaste everyone thank you surendra for for this uh, words i will now uh, share you my presentation can you see it yeah we can see you can you see presentation yes yes, yes we can okay see. great so everything works so uh, once more uh, hello everyone first of all i want to share with you my big gratitude to all of you for inviting me here to share uh, with you my research and our cultural heritage i am especially grateful for uh, two special people without whom we would not be able to meet today i want to thank nia trinkunene krive of the lithuanian romuva for contacting me year ago uh, with international center for cultural studies uh, for contacting me with surendra matur on the occasion of sun seminar conference where me and my friends from poland um, had a great occasion to present slavic traditions and mythology as a part uh, of our heritage i am also uh, very grateful to surendra matur 
for his great work of building bridges of cultural and spiritual uh, cooperation between India and Europe, and also for his invitation to me to give this lecture and uh, presenting today Slavic culture and mythology. We have been meeting with Surendra and our friends from Poland and Czech Republic for almost one year, making comparative uh, research on Indo-European connections between India and Slavic peoples. Uh, therefore, I hope that uh, our today's meeting will become a beginning of further and deeper cooperation on the field of uh, mutual understanding of uh, our cultures. My name is Mikołaj Ermakowski. I am from Poland, from the northern part of Poland, from the Kashubia region, which lies by the Baltic Sea itself. I'm studying ethnology, cultural anthropology on, and Slavic languages and culture in the University of Gdańsk. Uh, I work as a museum guide, storyteller, sometimes a musician and educator um, associated, with, associated with uh, promoting uh, in Poland knowledge about the cultures of of the Slavs and other Indo-European uh, cultures. And the main goal of my today's lecture is to present some very basic information on actual state of academic knowledge on the field of reconstruction of pre-Christian spiritual culture of Slavic uh, peoples. During my speech, I will present a brief history of Slavic peoples, the Indo-European origins and connections uh, migration routes, elements of research on their languages and archaeology, as well as 19th and 20th century ethnography of syncretic uh, folk customs, where despite Christianization, a lot of old tradition maintained and have been well uh, described by uh, folklore collectors in 19th and 20th uh, century. So, um, can you see the next slide of my presentation? Yes. Please. Okay, okay. So, first of all, um, a little bit about Indo-European roots and ethnogenesis of the Slavs. From what region of Europe Slavic peoples came and where we can look uh, for uh, their uh, eth ethnogenesis. Uh, at the very beginning of our journey through Slavic cultures, we have to go deeper into history and look for their very origins, which lies deep in Indo-European past. In reference to actual state of archaeological and linguistic knowledge, ethnogenesis of Indo-Europeans lies somewhere in area of Anatolic, which is theory of British archaeologist Colin Renfrew, or uh, lands between the Caspian and Black Sea, so-called uh, Kurgan theory of Professor Maria Gimbutas from the Lithuania. Uh, from archaeological point of view, such Neolithic, European Neolithic cultures like Yamnaya, culture of corded ware, um, uh, may be connected with uh, the first Indo-Europeans, um, uh, Indo-European traces in Europe. On the other hand, there are also some uh, genetic findings, mostly made by Dr. Johannes Krause from Max Planck Institute uh, of the Science for Human History, who shifted Indo-European expansion uh, to the Europe to around 6000 BC and connected it with the Corded Ware culture also. But uh, finally, we can see that Indo-European expansion to Europe was like a waves. It was heterogeneous and was connected with the separations and differentiations of individual peoples from the uh, primary Indo-European cradle. For all Indo-European cultures, we can find some basic common cultural, social, religious uh, conceptions, which lies very deep in sphere of language and worldview, especially mythological, mythological uh, worldview. Among other things, uh, researchers uh, pay attention to so-called the Indo-European model of people and gods, which uh, was reconstructed uh, mostly by French academic Georges Dumézil, basing on very large materials from Germanic, Celtic, Roman, Greek, uh, Scandinavian and Indian uh, mythology. Mythologies. He found that uh, Indo-Europeans used to divide uh, mythological world, society, and uh, the whole mythology into three spheres. 
first was sphere of sovereign social, political, and magical power. Uh, second was um, the sphere of war and warriors. And third was um, the sphere of agrarian production of agriculture. In the relation of these three spheres, he found foundations of Indo-European mythology. Uh, another common Indo-European myth, or even we can say archetype, was reconstructed by Russian researchers Ivanov and Toporov. Uh, this was connected with a very well-known motif of cosmogonical fight between thunder god from the sky, for example, Slavic Perun, Baltic Perkunas, Scandinavian, uh, Scandinavian Thor, Indian Indra, and Ketonic uh, god or some kind of chaotic mythological being like Slavic Veles or Dragon, Baltic Velinas, Scandinavian Trolls, or Indian uh, Vritra. In this myth, a myth of fight between Thunder God and uh, some deity of mythological being from Underworld, we can find a very essential Indo-European idea of a dynamic mythological harmony between two spheres of the mythological, mythological universe, which kept the uh, world alive uh, in the cyclic well of transformation. And one of the certain subgroups of Indo-European peoples uh, were the so-called Balto-Slavic peoples, which separated from the Indo-European cradle about uh, 3,500 years ago. The researchers used to talk about huge Balto-Slavic cultural horizon between Middle East Europe uh, and uh, in the Middle East Europe, between Baltic Sea in the north and uh, Black Sea um, in the south, which was the sphere where this group of Indo-European peoples was forming. Many connections can be found between uh, Balts and Slavs, especially in sphere of mythology and the mythological image of the world, which indicate uh, the archaic uh, common Balto-Slavic element. Some archaeologists used to connect this Balto-Slavic cultural horizon with archaeological Chciniec culture, which is marked in purple color on the left photo. And in accordance to this uh, theory, Baltic peoples stayed in the north of this region and directly preserved original layers of Indo-European culture which were enriched by the old European, pre-Indo-European hunter and gatherers, uh, substrate of the Narva culture. Ancestors of Slavic peoples from this Balto-Slavic group have stayed in the contemporary territory of southern Ukraine and west-south uh, part of Russia and came under the very strong influence of the Iranian peoples. Possibly there were three main waves of Iranian influence on the proto-Slavic peoples. First was connected with uh, Sumerians, second with uh, Scythians, and the third uh, with Sarmatians. Um, these were three very big Iranian tribes, uh, which influenced uh, very much on proto-Slavic. During this nearly 1,000 year long influence of the Iranian peoples uh, on southern part of group of Balto-Slavic peoples, specifically to the so-called Proto-Slavs, the most essential elements of their culture and worldview were shaped. This uh, process of the separation under the Iranian influence of the specific group of uh, ancient Balto-Slavic community is considered uh, to be the formation of the new cultural and social community, the Slavic community, uh, which uh, came from this Balto-Slavic community under the Iranian influence. Archaeologists and linguists uh, reconstructed social, cultural, political and economic aspects uh, of this Iranian influences such fundamental for uh, proto-Slavic ethnogenesis. Between about 500 uh, BC till 300 AC, so almost in a 1000 year period, proto-Slavs lived uh, in the southern and central part of today's Ukraine. 
Uh, they mainly occupied themselves with simple agriculture and lived there in forms of small tribal communities organized around simple open villages. They were strongly dominated by Iranian peoples, probably in uh, a form of some kind uh, political dependence. Researchers sometimes try to reconstruct the form of proto-Slavic Iranian relations in a form of structure uh, of relation of the dominant martial Iranian tribe uh, and more peaceful dependent uh, exploited and conquered by them proto-Slavs, farmers. Uh, those, the Slavs were a subordinate population in uh, this relation. There are some assumptions that proto-Slavs were obligated to pay tributes, which have stopped their demographic growing until the time when Iranians were ousted by the Huns in the beginning of the medieval era in Europe. The reconstructed form of Slavic-Iranian relation, relations are associated with so-called forest step area, which is natural for southern part of today's Ukraine. Uh, those the area of uh, proto-Slavic ethnogenesis. This territory of Slavic ethnogenesis uh, in contemporary southern Ukraine is still now a very fertile territory of humus. In fact, one of the best agricultural areas in the world. Um, this, uh, this land is, uh, is the region of very big fertility uh, to the agriculture. During the wars and invasions, the proto-Slavs uh, abandoned uh, their agricultural villages and uh, used to move to swamps and forests where they were waited till inv the invaders uh, will live. So we used to talk about uh, forest steppe organization of, of um, proto-Slavic life and uh, relations with Iranian peoples. Among the oldest Slavic national legends, we can find a very interesting and popular motif of the stranger who is arriving from the foreign land and finally is elected by local Slavic community as a king. It is possible that these legends are the trace, very important trace of Iranian uh, domination, probably based on imposing Iranian rulers, kings on the uh, proto-Slavic peoples. Uh, around 2nd, 4th century AD, uh, also uh, Gothic tribes from East Germanic language group had a strong contacts with proto-Slavs. We can find uh, language borrowings on both sides. And for example, uh, Gothic uh, word plinsian, to dance, come from old Slavic plonsati, uh, to dance. And in the photo on the right, you can see the territory where these culture forming processes took place, especially between um, proto-Slavic peoples and Iranian peoples who were coming uh, there uh, from, the, from the south. So uh, Iranian inversion among Slavic peoples, another slide. Uh, Iranian influence on proto-Slavs I was just talking about had been so strong that uh, researchers used to talk today about uh, so-called Iranian inversion among proto-Slavic peoples. Iranian peoples in the, in the process of developing their culture changed some very basic uh, ancient Indo-European mythological and religious conceptions. The culmination of this process was the religious reform initiated uh, by Zaratustra, also called Zoroaster, basing on the ancient Iranian Mazdaist religion close to the beliefs and mythology contained, uh, for example, in Rig Veda. Uh, he introduced a religious dualism between Ahura Mazda and Ariman. Iranians, by the influence of the Zoroaster's uh, reform, revalorized the old Indo-European theological concepts. They changed ancient Indo-European name for God, they was in reconstructed primary Indo-European language to the Phaga or Ahura, 
In consequence of this process, they associated uh, original word deivos with the aves, uh, mythological demons. So they, they changed uh, totally uh, this old Indo-European dualism. They revalorized it. Also, the proto-Slavic peoples, by the Iranian influence, change uh, the same Indo-European religious terminology. In a place of word deivos, Indo-European primary word for God, they introduced Bagha, which they borrowed uh, from the Iranians and transformed into old Slavic word uh, Bog. And here uh, some examples of proto-Slavic borrowings from uh, Iranian languages are presented. I choose only uh, these ones, which relates uh, to the religion on my, on, uh, or mythology. But it is also very important that uh, vocabulary associated with smithery uh, and agriculture and uh, social power also uh, have um, also Iranian origin in Slavic languages. And here are these examples. First, uh, first of all, um, uh, the word for, for God, which I um, got, which, are, which I mentioned about a moment ago. In Polish language, it is Bóg. Uh, it is coming from, it comes from Slavic, old Slavic word Bog. And it is early, uh, it's borrowing from early and late Iranian word Baga, which means distributor and also uh, God. Bag, uh, give and receive portions. And for example, in, in one uh, old Persian des, uh, description, we can find the uh, word Bagyak Yaradi, for the God. And here is uh, also Russian, so also Slavic synonym, Bogaradi, also, which also means uh, for the God. And uh, this uh, vocabulary is connected with Sanskrit uh, word Haga, prosperity and good fortune, which comes from pre-Indo-European reconstructed uh, root Pag to give. So here we can uh, we can uh, see that this uh, Slavic, proto-Slavic, and also uh, probably Iranian conception of God, um, um, uh, understood by the word Haga or Bog, was connected with prosperity, good fortune, with giving some uh, materials, material goods. And here is uh, mentioned this inversion of old Indo-European word they was God. To, for example, Polish Dziw, something strange, uh, and uh, Polish Dziwożona, Slovenian Divażena, female demon kidnapping children's, children. And um, um, some trace of this uh, ancient Indo-European word Deivos, we can also find in contemporary Polish word Dzień, and Serbian, for example, and Czech uh, word Dan, which means day. Another word, very important, secret, Polish święty, uh, coming, uh, comes from uh, old Slavic root spent, and uh, for example, Avestan, so Iranian spenta, which comes from Indo-European quento, uh, which means powerful and healthy. Uh, another uh, word, heaven paradise, um, connected with afterlife, Polish rai, uh, Czech Rai, Slovenian, uh, and it comes from old Slavic root Rai, uh, which comes from Middle Persian Rai, happiness, fortune, and uh, old Iranian Rai, fortune, which is uh, also connected with Sanskrit Rai, uh, property and uh, some material goods. Even paradise when souls go in form of birds. Um, it, it is connected with um, beliefs that after death, death uh, some part of human soul is going to the um, uh, underworld, to the place, of, to, the, to the kingdom of ancestors in a form of a bird. But uh, we have, for example, Polish dialectal Viraj, Russian Iri or Viraj, which comes from old Iranian Vairiad. This what should be chosen. Uh, and also fro from old Iranian var to choose. And here we can see that this idea of uh, afterlife was connected with some kind of religious uh, 
uh, choosing yes some way or or some uh, destiny after after death uh, something good blissfully uh, in polish language uh, błogo in russian dialectal uh, language bologo in bulgarian which is also slavic language blago and uh, this uh, word uh, comes from Avestian, so Iranian uh, word bereg, right, ritual. So here we can find this connection between uh, between between something good and blissfully and uh, ritual as a way to to sharing with this uh, emotion, faith, uh, Polish wiara, Czech wiara, Russian vera. It comes from uh, old Slavic word vera, certain, uh, certainty that something is true, trust in something. And this word comes from Iranian var, to choose. In religious context, to choose between good and evil. Sacrifice, uh, ritual sacrifice, I mean. A Polish żertwa, old Polish word żyżec, sacrificial, sacrificial priest, which comes from uh, old Slavic word żryti to make an offering. And it is connected with Iranian word zaotra, ritual libation. And the last uh, word wisdom, Polish mądrość, uh, Russian mudrost, and it comes from uh, old Slavic uh, word mądr, and uh, it comes from Iranian word mądran, one who knows religious formulas. So here we can see that some very fundamental vocabulary for religion um, have in Slavic languages Iranian origins. So um, a lot of um, mythological uh, knowledge and uh, religious conceptions uh, of uh, old Slavic peoples are similar with, uh, with Iranians, Iranian ones because of uh, this very long uh, connection between uh, Iranians and, uh, and Slavic peoples. And uh, here in the next slide, uh, you can see some examples of, uh, of material culture of proto-Slavic peoples from the period of their contacts with uh, Iranians. Uh, in the upper left corner is the photo of the forest steppe of southern Ukraine so this area where Slavic peoples have formed uh, some very basics uh, of their culture. In the bottom right corner, uh, drawing uh, of uh, typical Slavic houses presented. It used to be called half dugout house because of its uh, built into the uh, ground. And this type of arch architecture was uh, very typical uh, for, uh, for Slavic peoples. So now we are going uh, to the next uh, slide. Slavs in Europe, great expansion. With the uh, beginning of medieval era, Iranian peoples began to lose importance and power in East Europe. It is presumed that Slavs, proto-Slavic, with the uh, weakening of Iranian nomads uh, started to free themselves from their rule and cultural and political domination. One of the reasons why Iranians began to um, get weaker was expansion of Hans headed by Attila uh, in early medieval era. As I mentioned above, the territory of proto-Slavic ethnogenesis was a very rich and fertile uh, from agriculture uh, point of view. Uh, the lands of southern Ukraine till now uh, are one of the best uh, for farming. Archaeologists assume that uh, proto-Slavs during era of Iranian domination were obligated to pay them a special tributes. Uh, from agriculture produces, for example, cereals uh, or bread. This depend dependence uh, from the Iranians and economic constraints were the reason why proto-Slavic hadn't been growing demographically uh, for near 1000 years uh, in the antiquity. After the Slavs became independent from Iranians, food production uh, surpluses began to appear in their economy. This in turn caused a very sharp 
demographic increase among Slavic peoples and in consequence, uh, the rapid growth of their communities. Then they began the, to migrate to the north, east, uh, west and south uh, part of Europe. The period of Slavic great expansion uh, dates from 4th uh, to 8th century AD. Uh, we have uh, first written sources about Slavic peoples from this period, which were written down by chronicles of the Byzantine, Byzantine Empire. In these sources, uh, Slavs were described as a huge and uh, powerful tribes, very dynamic and belligerent. Byzantines didn't have any idea uh, how to fight with uh, their expansion. Slavic peoples uh, used to fight with using of traps and even uh, in uh, one paper from this, uh, from this time, uh, it was mentioned that before the battle, they had hid in the swamp, being under water, they breathed uh, through tubes, and when enemy uh, forces came, they jumped out from the swamp and attacked. Uh, Prokop from Caesarea wrote at that time that uh, Slavic peoples worshipped the thunder and used to give offerings to water and nature spirits. For about 400 years of expansion, uh, Slavic peoples assimilated and sometimes also conquered a lot of tribes and other local peoples um, in north, uh, west and south uh, part of Europe. In fact, they um, took a half of Europe's territory, which is marked uh, on green in the map presented here. What is uh, very important is that uh, is this that Slavic peoples assimilated and absorbed during the expansion a lot of local tribes and peoples, especially Baltic uh, peoples in contemporary land of Belarus, Russia and Poland, Germanic in contemporary territory of Poland and Germany, uh, Finno-Ugric peoples in the northern part of Russia and in south uh, part of Europe, Thracians, Dacs and Turkic uh, tribes of Proto-Bulgars. Uh, therefore, we should investigate Slavic culture as a form of something heterogeneous in many spheres and aspects, but on the other hand, uh, sharing a common change here and there a proto-Slavic element. Ethnonym Slavic or Slavs in Slavic uh, languages Sloveni, Slaviane or Słowianie means uh, those who are together uh, in common word. Here I put etymology of uh, ethnonym Slavic, Słowianie in Polish, in Serbian language Sloveni, in Russian language Slaviane, it comes from uh, old Slavic word Slovo, word, um, and it comes from Prindo European Klewos, to be famous. And it is connected with Sanskrit Shravas, uh, fame and honor. So, Slavs, uh, those who are together in common word. Um, uh, Slavs as uh, tribes and societies uh, were distinguishing uh, themselves from other peoples, for example, Germanic peoples, because of their language. It is very likely that they were uh, defining language, uh, their language, as the primary determinant of familiarity and social bounds. Um, that uh, they saw language as this would separate our people from alien strangers, from other tribes, other peoples, other nations. It is significant in this context that uh, Slavs till now used to call foreign people's uh, word mute. And uh, for example, Polish people used to uh, call um, Germans those who could not speak, uh, mute people, those who do not have words. Uh, so this idea of language and word uh, we can see was uh, very important for, for Slavic peoples. Traditionally, three groups of Slavs are distinguished. Eastern, uh, which is here, uh, Western, which is here, and Southern, which is uh, here. 
by the 9th uh, uh, century AD, the Slavic tribes had united uh, locally in the form of local states. And by the 12th century, the rulers of all Slavic tribes adopted Christianity. Christianization was related to the strengthening of uh, structure of feudal states uh, because worshipping of one God based on the very strong institution of the church gave for the ruler um, better political stability than many local tribal cults. Moreover, Christianization uh, was uh, then the only way to obtain political legitimacy, legitimacy uh, from Western Europe countries, uh, and it also protected against Christian states, uh, especially Germany, conquesting under the pretext of Christianization uh, missions. And here are dates of um, baptism, or official baptism of Slavic states, uh, Poland 9, 966, and three so-called pagan uprisings uh, against Christianity in Poland, Kievan Rus uh, 988, and another two pagan uprisings against Christianity, and uh, very symbolical date, um, destruction of Świętowit Temple in Rugia, which was here, um, in the western part of Slavic territory. Um, this was the last official temple of uh, old Slavic religion. So um, its destruction is considered to be symbolical date of uh, ending official, uh, official history of, of Slavic religion as an institutional or, and political force in, in this part of uh, Europe. And here is contemporary map with uh, contemporary situation of, of Slavic peoples in Europe. Uh, what is also very important is that, uh, that about 1000 years ago, so during um, forming these first uh, states, uh, proto-Slavic linguistic community began to differentiate. With the founding of states by individual Slavic tribes, the language began to diversify and like now, we can distinguish three groups of Slavic, uh, Slavic languages that I mentioned a moment ago. So East Slavic languages, Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Russian. West Slavic uh, languages, Kashubian, Polish, Silesian, Czech, uh, uh, Slo uh, Slovak language, and in uh, part of Germany, Sorbian, Lusitian languages and southern part of uh, Slavic languages, Bulgarian, Macedonian, Serbian, uh, Croatian, and, and Slovenian also. So now we are going to the main part of my lecture, Slavic mythology and spiritual culture, basic sources and uh, methods of research. Now we have a question, how to get to know and research pre-Christian spiritual culture of uh, the Slavic peoples. First of all, we have to underline that uh, the fundamental problem of such work is, that, uh, is the fact that Slavic peoples were illiterate. They didn't have their own alphabet. Therefore, all written sources from early medieval era were wrote uh, down mostly by Christian Christians or sometimes Jews and Muslims. These early medieval written sources are mostly based and laconic and try to present Slavic uh, religions, pre-Christianic, uh, pre-Christian Slavic religions in uh, the worst possible light as uh, pagan opposite to Christianity. Uh, concluding from early medieval chronicles, uh, and materials, uh, we have uh, over a dozen names of worshipped gods and goddesses, some descriptions of temples and rituals, and quite well described social aspects of the functioning of, functioning of uh, old beliefs and relation of church to it. And here are some examples of early medieval written sources uh, connected uh, with uh, researching Slavic religion. Uh, for example, uh, 
description of Christianization mission uh, among Western Slavic peoples, the life of Saint Otto, uh, chronicles like the Chronicle of Helmold, also connected with Polabian Slavic, so West Slavic uh, tribe, and from the Kievan Rus, uh, first uh, Rus, uh, Kievan Rus chronicle, the tale of bygone years. Um, and uh, some Arab travelers relation, like relation of al um or Ibrahim ibn, ibn Yaqub. Uh, materials uh, discovered by archaeologists are, one, are a very important source. These are mainly material traces of uh, religious practices, sculptures, ornaments, ritual places, traces of offerings, and cemetery, uh, cemeteries also. We can obtain a lot of uh, information from comparative and historical research on Slavic uh, languages. Here I mentioned semantics and etymology of vocabulary related to the religion and mythology, especially its relation to the Iranian and uh, other Indo-European languages. And however, the most important uh, and the most extensive source of knowledge in the field of research of, of the culture of old Slavic peoples is folk culture, folklore, namely culture of 19th and 20th centuries villagers. Uh, customs, rituals, magic, beliefs, mythology, fairy tales, songs, riddles, art and decoration. To understand uh, the validity of the study of folklore in the context of uh, research about the religion of pre-Christian uh, Slavic peoples, we must look at the process of Christianization. As I mentioned above, time of official baptism uh, of Slavic medieval states is the early medieval era more precisely about around the 10th uh, century AD. Christianity have been penetrating, uh, uh, have been penetrating different social strata with uh, varying power. Date of official baptism uh, is in fact date of the baptism of the ruler and his closest circle. Wider Christianization process was in fact connected with building a network of monasteries and churches and um, only then slow, very slow religious penetration into uh, the population, especially village population. The process of Christianization was especially slow among the village population which preserved a lot of pre-Christian religious and cultural residues for a very, very long time. There are three main reasons why we can uh, reach, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, find so rich traces of old Slavic beliefs and mythology among folk village cultures of 19th and 20th uh, century. Uh, first, till the 19th century, villagers uh, of Central East Europe lived in the feudal system in which they didn't have any possibility of any mobility. Peasants were bounded to the ground and subordinate to the nobility. In the um, uh, European medieval feudal system, villages were closed uh, to contacts with the outside world. Uh, villages were isolated, in fact social uh, consequence of near 800 years long uh, feudal isolation of the villagers was uh, described by one of Polish anthropologists as a conscious isolation of uh, peasants, of villagers. This feudal isolation of the countryside in East um, Central Europe can be seen in the degree of illiteracy uh, which in 19th century was about 18% in some regions of contemporary Poland and uh, Ukraine. Second uh, thing, process of spreading uh, Christianity among villagers was also not so easy. Traditional rituals and uh, celebrations like Gode, which is winter solstice, or Kupala night, which is summer solstice, uh, were preserved in folk tradition till um, the 20th century. 
of course, in a changed form, but with a well-preserved Slavic model uh, of symbols and uh, mythological meanings. By the researching of uh, church documents, we can investigate the process of Christianization in the villages. As the chronicles, church chronicles show, cases of officially, um, uh, officially celebrating pagan rites, pre-Christian rites, happened even 500 years or uh, more after the, um, uh, after the official baptism of the rulers. Peasants, although in the 19th century defined themselves as Christians, they interpreted the religion, uh, Christian religion learned in the churches in their own way and adopted it uh, to magical practices, agrarian culture, and well-preserved Slavic cosmology. Therefore, in many 19th and 20th century ethnographic materials like folk songs, folk legends, we can find a mix of old Slavic traditions and Christian symbolism included um, into them. Uh, and uh, mm, also, um, the last part of, of uh, methods of research is Indo-European Indo uh, comparative uh, research. So comparison between some reconstructed Slavic uh, myths and uh, religious practices with other and other ones in the Indo-Europeans, uh, especially Baltic and uh, Iranians. And uh, to show you uh, this process, uh, how this process of Christianization look like, I will uh, quote uh, words uh, of uh, one traditional villager from southern Ukraine. This quote refers to the changes in winter rituals that followed with uh, the interventions of the church in the 19th and 20th centuries, so 100, 200 years ago. Uh, and 800 years after official baptization of uh, rulers. It comes from the Hutzulszczyzna region. Uh, in English, I think it is Hutzuli region. Uh, it is in uh, southern Ukraine, um, near border with Romania, where Christianity came very late in some areas, even in the 16th uh, century. Uh, here is this, this quote. The Hutzul community, was then in the 19th century in a situation of forcibly agreeing to certain concessions to representatives of the church authorities. These changes concerned the inclusion of biblical stories to the structure of old in Ukrainian Starovitsky, which means ancient folk ritual songs and those the uh, abandonment or modification of uh, older texts of songs. The abon uh, abandonment of dances and singing not related to the biblical content, as well as the prohibition of the use of instruments such as skripka, trembita, or others. These were ritually used instruments connected with pre-Christian religious practices. One of um, Orthodox priest, um, Christian priests spoke to the Hutsuls in this way. These are pagan, not Christian songs. Such songs cannot be uh, singed because they cause unforgivable sin. I got a letter from the major priest that these Christmas songs, like yours, must be deleted forever. The uh, priests ordered uh, to singers to the singers to compile new Christmas text based not on traditional content connected with uh, the winter solstice and uh, Slavic tradition, <clears throat> but on the biblical story of the passion of Jesus Christ. And here is another description of Petro Shekirik uh, Doni Donikiv, who in that time and that region was the head of uh, one village called Zabi. Until the middle of the 19th century, in our mountains, nobody persecuted our ritual singers. Uh, ancient ritual songs were the ancient words of the god. 
from the beginning of the centuries, our ancestors of um, uh, our ancestors greeted with these uh, words our God, the Sun God, Boch Sonce in Ukrainian. Orthodox Christian carols, Christmas, Christmas songs were not accepted, disliked, and village people used to refuse to study them. From the 19th century, priests opposed ancient songs and their singers and were ordered to eradicate them. They shouted from churches that Hutsul, uh, traditional old songs, were pagan, not Christian, and it was a sin to perform them. One time, the uh, priests did not let uh, the singers to sing and ordered their leaders to compose new text based uh, on the text from the gospel. And this quote, I will remind, uh, from the 19th century. So these words have about 100, 150 years. So it was not so long ago. This quote is a very important uh, in that reason that it concerns recent times, the 19th century. Similar actions of fighting uh, the folk tradition, uh, Slavic folk tradition, were also undertaken by the church in other Slav Slavic countries, but uh, much earlier, already in the 14th or 15th centuries, so in the medieval era. In the area of Hutsulland, um, that the influence of the church took place much later and therefore many traditions have been preserved and there and the process of church activism focused uh, focused on the eradication is well described and we can uh, look how this process of christianization of destroying old tradition uh, looked like the background of this conflict, which I um, which I quote a moment ago, uh, was Christmas, uh, which in uh, uh, in the Christmas tradition, in the Christian Christian church tradition, is associated with the birth of Jesus, and in the folk Slavic tradition, with the cult of the sun god, sun god. Uh, sun god. In the old ritual songs, um, the dominant motif. Uh, is the sun and other celestial bodies like moon uh, or evening aurora or stars, for example. Uh, therefore, the Christian priests wanted to replace them uh, with those related to, to Jesus. And this process, for example, we can see also in Polish folk songs where uh, we, we, where we have um, uh, old we can say pagan uh, with pagan origin songs uh, and the plots uh, of and stories uh, of these songs are connected with uh, old pre-christian slavic mythology but inside of the structure of the songs are christian signs uh, and for example jesus is presented like a sun uh, and some christian saints uh, are very strongly connected with uh, pre-christian symbols this is form of syncretism, pagan Christian syncretism. And the third aspect um, of long preservation of pre-Christian Slavic traditions by the oral tradition of the villagers have strong economic background. As I mentioned above, old Slavic culture had strong connotation with agriculture, with farming. Most of the religious rituals and mythological sphere was related to agriculture work, grain, bread, fields, and other aspects of farming. Villagers uh, of uh, Middle East Europe um, till 20th century dealt almost only with agriculture, with farming. This uh, fact uh, was of course connected with feudal system uh, which I mentioned also a um, moment ago, in which peasants didn't have any laws to change their occupation. Therefore, long duration uh, of old uh, mythological worldview and traditions had strong economical context. It was very closely, these traditions were very closely related to the source of income, uh, which was agriculture and uh, farming. Uh, those who study in folklore of 19th and 20th century used to talk about two processes. Christianization of old beliefs, 
Christianization of old Slavic beliefs, uh, myths and customs, and secondly, folklorization, uh, Slavization of Christianity, which peasants adapted, of course, uh, um, to adapted to their culture, to their needs and their, their way of life. So researchers used to talk about so-called cosmic Christianity or village Christianity. Uh, in fact, syncretism, syncretic form of old pagan beliefs and Christian uh, religion. Therefore, 19th and 20th century folklore is a very rich source of knowledge because uh, of the great abundance of materials. 19th and 20th centuries are the ages of national awakening uh, when nations uh, of uh, East and Middle Europe uh, also Slavic nations, started to look for their own national identity. Many of them were looking for it among villagers, where, um, as they believed, original and truly uh, national culture was uh, preserved. Therefore, we have uh, a huge amount of uh, materials from this era. Songs, tales, legends, myths, uh, customs, folk art, described rituals, magical practices, uh, and the other ones. And uh, here um, uh, in this slide, Christianization, folklore, and structures of long uh, duration. Uh, to visualize, to visualize uh, you these long processes of Christianization and long, long duration of pre Christian traditions. I put four examples from 19th and 20th century Slavic uh, folk culture. In the upper left corner, we have uh, uh, the photo, black white photo uh, of rain ritual from Serbia. Uh, this photo was taken uh, about uh, 70 years ago. Namely, uh, this photo shows so-called ritual of Peperuda Dodolica or Kust among East Slavic uh, peoples. The ritual was to choose a young girl, dress her up in green leaves and pour water on her with a special song. The main topic uh, of songs dedicated to this ritual uh, is the goddess or some other mythological being named Dodolica or Peperuda, who is asking uh, main god to let the rain fall open the sky and free the waters from it. A girl dressed in green can be considered as a representation of the Dodolica, this mythological being, an image of a water spirit called Rusalka or also Mother Earth goddess, who to be fertile needs water from a sky god. The ritual was performed during drove, sometimes during spring uh, celebrations until the mid 20th uh, century. So, so uh, even uh, 15 years, 50 years ago, it was possibility of, of see uh, such rituals in, in Serbia uh, or other South Slavic countries. In the upper right corner, you can see photo from Poland, which shows spring tradition of Morana Marzanna dwelling, um, uh, on which also Surendra uh, talked a little about. It was known in many forms among almost all, uh, all Slavs, and today it is uh, still a very popular custom, but not as a ritual, but some form of, uh, we can say, children play. But among villagers, drowning of Morana uh, had a very strict ritual meaning. The rite used to take place with the beginning of spring. Marzanna or Morana, who was drowned in the water as the big uh, effigy, represented the goddess of winter, who with the beginning of spring used to go to the underworld. Uh, the first sources about this custom uh, come from 16th century church chronicles. The church uh, tried to ban, uh, ban it or change into Christian version, such as destroying the biblical Judas uh, effigy, but uh, its failed villagers were attached to their tradition very much. And uh, originally, 
This ritual had a mythological context. It was believed that drowned uh, to the water, Morana, Majanna is going to the underworld uh, land of the dead. And uh, during uh, spring, young fertility god called Yarilo is looking uh, for her because uh, it was believed that Yarilo is in love mm, in Morana and love between Morana and Yarilo is connected with uh, the spring and summer. Uh, in the uh, lower left corner, there is, there is also a photo of so-called Turoni. Uh, this is some form of mask or uh, ritual outfit that depicts a hairy and horned monster. During the winter solstice celebration, the same celebration which I mentioned above in a form of quote uh, from Hutsuli region uh, of Ukraine, um, when I was talking about these changes in the songs, young boys used to dress up in ritual cast, uh, costumes depicting creatures uh, from the underworld. In these costumes, they used to go from the house to the house with uh, special songs, including mythological motifs and good wishes for the new solar cycle. The church had fought uh, with these practices since the 12th century and despite the threats of curses and excommunication to those who practice it, uh, the tradition was not broken. In some regions it is popular, uh, very popular till now. Some symbolical changes uh, of this tradition took place in the 16th and 17th uh, centuries in the form of in including into uh, of including into Christian motifs into it Christian motif associ associated with Christmas and celebration of uh, Jesus birthday and whole symbolism connected with uh, with Jesus. Finally, the fourth photo uh, is contemporary and comes from Polish Belarusian Podlasie region. In this photo, you can see so-called grandmother, babka or babcia traditional village magical healer, the woman who heal uh, by the using of prayers and so-called magical practices. Um, but uh, uh, only anthropologists and, and people who, who, is who are studying this, these rituals from the scientific point of view used to call it magical practices. These women do not call it uh, magical practices, healing. They only used to talk that they are praying to the God. It is very important. Uh, these old women's grandmothers used to call themselves intermediaries between God and men. In their practices, we can find some old genealogically Slavic elements, such prayers uh, to Zorje Zorjenice, uh, three goddesses of uh, morning, uh, mm, noon and evening lights, the use of fire, water and egg uh, in healing practices, and also Christian elements like prayers, sacred paintings with signs, uh, crosses also. So it is another example of um, pagan Christian syncretism uh, in sphere of, of some uh, village practices. And, uh, and here uh, on this next slide, we will do a small break from very theoretical knowledge. I will present you some photos of important archeological findings, arts and folk uh, traditions to bring you a little closer to the spirit and aesthetics of Slavic cultures. In the upper left corner, you can see four-headed wooden idol founded in Volin in contemporary Western Poland. It comes from early medieval period and uh, represents the local chief god Świętowit or Svantewit, who was worshipped in Rugia Island mostly. His name Świętowit uh, means um, the one who is powerful. Święty means powerful and wit it is uh, like uh, um, someone important we can say święty wit świętowit it is it is the etymology of, of this name świętowit uh, was the chief god of the rugian tribe 
he patronized war, tribal power, and the fertility of the fields. It was believed that he rides a white horse and fight with chaotical forces at the night. And Świętowit is sometimes considered to be a West Slavic form of uh, thunder uh, god, which among uh, East Slavic, uh, Belarusian, Ukrainians, Russians is known as a Perun, um, strongly connected with Baltic uh, Perkunas. On the right, you can see woolen belts used to tie the clothing. They are called krajki, and apart from the practical use, they also had a ritual magical meaning. The symbols of these belts had a protective magical meaning, and the weaving uh, of these belts was associated with the myth of the creation of the world. It was believed that making such belt was a magical creation activity connected with the world's creation. Uh, these belts, Kraiki, played an important role during the wedding ceremonies or brotherhood uh, ceremonies when the young couple were tied together by them as a sign of uh, their uh, unity. In the lower left corner, there is a photo of wooden idol from uh, medieval territory of Western Slavs. According to some theories, uh, it uh, presents the divine, uh, divine twins, sons of sky god, uh, guardians of fertility or guardians of sun goddess. Next are examples of Slavic jewelry and arts. And in the right uh, lower corner, there are examples of typical Slavic woman jewelry, so-called kobłączki. Uh, kobłączki, which uh, were worn uh, here by the uh, head, also with usage of uh, uh, such, uh, such belt li li like here. Um, and uh, like now, uh, a few words about the national costumes and their symbolism. Uh, in, in, in context of Slavic culture. In the upper right corner, you can see 19th century folk costume from Podlaski region from uh, Eastern Poland. Pay attention to the embroidery and uh, embroidered patterns. According to research of the, for example, Russian uh, folklorist uh, Piotr Bogatyryev, traditional folk costume was in fact a code of uh, social and mythological symbols and powers related to the person who was worried. Therefore, we can consider the folk costume as a, um, some kind of symbolical code dedicated to person who was wearing it. Three photos uh, which are on the left shows the reconstructed costumes uh, from early uh, medieval pre-Christian era. Please look at the woman's outfit here I want to uh, thank very much to my friend Luisa Jawoska uh, for the photos. Uh, two pieces of uh, women's outfit were, were very important. The apron, in Polish it is zapaska. So this part of costume, which is uh, here, uh, which is exactly here. And uh, it was believed that uh, the fertility forces that a woman possesses accumulate in, in, this, uh, in this apron. Secondly, uh, here uh, you can see form of the wedding cap uh, with which the woman covered her hair after the wedding. Before the wedding, uh, a woman wore her hair loose after the wedding in a braid uh, and uh, covered it with this uh, cup uh, or, or some piece of uh, material. Uh, and it also had uh, magical connections with, uh, uh, with the fertility uh, which woman possesses. And here in the next slide are some examples of uh, folk art and uh, folk decor. In the upper left corner, you can see so-called Leluja for uh, Eastern North uh, Poland, and uh, it is here, uh, which is the image of the cosmic tree, tree of life. Mythical tree, which grow in the central part of the universe and uh, is uniting uh, sky, earth, and the underworld. Mm, uh, 
in the upper right corner here, there is a fragment of country cottage uh, inside uh, the core. It is worth paying attention to the object hanging uh, from the ceiling. In Polish language, it is called pająk. In English, it will be a spider. It had cosmological and mythological meanings. It was also connected with the idea of, of cosmic tree. Below, on the left here, is a painted house from, from the Zalikie village in southern Poland. The ornamentation used in the drawings is associated with the cult of fertility and the symbolism of the cosmic tree. Central part of the mythological universe, which is also symbolized in the social sphere by the house as a central place uh, for the family. So, so house was considered to be uh, strongly connected with the cosmic tree, with the central part of the universe. At the right, there are painted eggs here, um, so-called pisanki. The tradition of X painting combined with Eastern, uh, Easter uh, during Christianization have in fact pre-Christian origins connected with the cosmological myth and egg as a symbol of life and uh, fertility and also word creation. And here we are going to, to this topic of egg and uh, to talk about cosmogonical myth. So how the world was created in Slavic mythology. Um, we will start from uh, cosmogonical myth, which is about uh, creation of the universe. Slavic folk tradition preserved two main plots of cosmogony, which probably were in some aspects connected in the past. A Slavic cosmogony is reconstructed on the base of folk tales, songs, rituals which related to it and also folk ornaments uh, such uh, as I presented above, uh, presenting how village people saw the whole universe and the symbols of this universe. The first myth about the creation of the world used to be called myth about the cosmic egg. We have several sources for reconstruction of this myth. Among, uh, among the folk beliefs described by ethnographers, there is sometimes a story such as the one quoted here, which comes from uh, central Poland. Poland. The earth was created from the big egg that lay on a very high tree. And this is ethnographic note from Poland from 19th century. Uh, we have uh, several such, uh, such descriptions. More detailed stories can be found in Russian folk tales, which were studied by such academicians like Ivanov, uh, Toporov, uh, and Prop. Among Russian folk tales, there is a popular motif of kingdoms, uh, which uh, can be rolled and hidden inside a magical egg, and in consequence of a special ritual, connected with uh, some form of ritual sacrifice from the chaotical uh, dragon uh, and, and uh, chaotical force of, of this dragon. Um, uh, these kingdoms can be also freed from this magical X. So the egg is an object inside which all reality, the universe can be hidden and from which it can be also created. Therefore, egg have in Slavic symbolism very big significance. All rituals and magical practices related to the idea of changing reality, like healing or creating a new reality, like, like courtship or wedding, were inseparable from the egg. Uh, a very important ritual in folk tradition, which was the first spring field plowing, connected with agriculture, so very important in Slavic tradition, as I mentioned, also began with an egg sacrifice uh, to Mother Earth. Egg also has some connections with sunrise, which in Indo-European traditions was believed to be a time when world is recreating after the chaos of the night. Many folk rituals which were dedicated to the multiplication of something and creation of something were performed during the sunrise. 
people believed that uh, then the cosmogony is repeated with the with the sun which is uh, shining in the morning also in many ritual songs we can find parallel between sunrise so creation of the world in the morning and the rapture of uh, the mythical egg and here are some examples shine shine dear sun i will give you an egg when the hen lies it in the oak forest, take it to the haven. Polish folk spell calling uh, the sun. This song was sung by sheep herds. In it, the sun was asked to come uh, out from behind the clouds and um, in return, the sheep herds used to offer to the sun the egg light on the oak tree. Oak tree uh, represent here the cosmic tree, the central part of universe uh, through, 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 through which offerings and prayers are sending. And another song. Oh, there is a red egg nearby. Oh, morning, early morning, red egg. Let us wait and hold it in our hands. Oh, morning, early morning, and hold it in our hands. When the sun, flash, when the sun flashes, the egg will burst. Oh, morning, early morning. And this song is in Polish li like it. O już niedaleczko, czerwone jajeczko. Oj, rano, ranienko, czerwone jajeczko. This is very old, very ancient melody, which we can find also in many another um, ancient uh, songs. And these songs come from Polish Belarusian border and was sung in the spring. Uh, it shows a parallel between uh, the sunrise, mythologically the rebirth of the world in the morning, and the break uh, of the of the eggs. Springtime it is uh, is also very important because it was believed that during spring, uh, with uh, with the return of the life to the earth after the winter the whole universe is recreating. Uh, and some researchers associate this, uh, associates the myth of the cosmic tree with the myth mythological deity Svarok. <coughs> Svarok, probably the chief god uh, of the Eastern Slavs, divine blacksmither, god of uh, heavenly fire, a giver of rights and agriculture. In these reconstructions, the beginning of the universe is asso associated with the fire, Svarok, fire god Svarok, who is inside this cosmic egg and by whose power uh, the egg breaks. In folklore, we can find beliefs that the highest god lives in a very high haven uh, that is constantly on fire. In later folklore mm, tradition, the highest god was often compared with the fiery sky uh, or the sun as a symbol of fire. In the folk songs, there is a motif of blacksmith who forges uh, ritual objects in the smithy on the top of the cosmic tree and who never puts out his fire. All these can, uh, all these traditions, all these materials can be related with, uh, to the idea of the god of the gods, the oldest uh, creator god, the one who hatched as a divine uh, fire from the cosmic egg at the beginning of the universe. And uh, second cosmogonical myth, which we can find in Slavic folklore, uh, and which has been preserved much better um, uh, than this connected with egg is so-called the myth of the diving. The plot of this myth is a very universal and known among uh, many other peoples in Asia, South and North America and Europe. Mirce Eliade, for example, found this mythological plot as uh, one of the oldest mythological stories uh, of the humanity. Slavic folklore version of this myth had been written down from the, uh, from the 17th uh, till late 20th century among villagers, and there are about uh, 200, 200 versions of this cosmogony. And the plot of this myth told that at the beginning of the world, there was only a great ocean, and on this ocean there were two brothers, God 
and the devil. God was in the boat and the devil swam in the water. And, uh, and, and one moment they met and the devil offered uh, God to create the earth. God agreed and commanded, uh, commanded the devil to swim under the water uh, to the bottom of the great ocean and bring free uh, grains of sand from it. Devil had to go with a special spell. When taking the grains uh, of the earth, he had to say, Earth, I am taking you in the name of God and my. When he dived first time, he said, Earth, I am taking you in the name of my. And he failed to take any grain of sand. When he dived second time, he said, Earth, I am taking you in the name of my. And he again then failed to take any grain of sand. And finally, when he dived third time, he said, Earth, I'm taking you in the name of God and my. And then he managed to take three grains of sand from the bottom of the great ocean. Uh, he gave uh, them to the God and the God created from them the first earth, so-called Buyan Island with the white stone Alatir, uh, Awatir uh, at the center. When the island was created, God and the devil went to sleep. When God uh, had fell asleep, the devil began to push him into the water, wanting to drown him. But it was impossible. The water parted and uh, the earth began to rise very, very fast. God continued to, to sleep the earth grew uh, grew very fast and the devil ran away at some point god woke up he looked around and saw that the earth was growing very very fast he was worried about it he wondered how to stop earth from growing such quickly he created uh, then a bee that he sent to learn from the devil how to do it how to stop um, this very fast uh, growing of the earth bee overheard the devil saying that to stop earth growing, it is needed to create four sticks, uh, four oak sticks, and put them at the fourth ends uh, of, um, uh, of the earth, four liminal points, and say, enough of this earth. God had did it, and the earth stopped uh, of uh, growing. Later, in the myth's plot, God and the devil have a battle with each other. The devil uh, takes the form of a dragon that kidnaps cows or bring winter. It was believed that the cows of winter is the kidnapping of fertility by the devil or dragon. Uh, God, the thunderer, strikes him, strikes this dragon with lightning and then re um, realizes uh, fertility and uh, summer finally returns. The devil lives in the underworld and the god lives in the haven. The earth is located between them, is the middle world, uh, and is therefore a sphere of collision, a sphere of conflict between these two opposing forces. Despite the fact that the folk uh, texts of the myth, written, mainly, written down mainly, mainly in the 19th and 20th centuries, depict Christian figures, god and the devil, the plot and structure of the story are very much earlier, uh, with Slavic origin. The folk images of God and the devil are also uh, an example of the above-mentioned folklorization and Slavization of Christianity, in which the Christian content uh, penetrating into the Slavic tradition uh, was transformed by villagers. And here it is example of uh, putting two Christian figures into the uh, pre-Christian um, uh, Slavic uh, mythological uh, story. So now we have a very important question. How this myth looked originally? What mythological figures and beings uh, were in it before its Christianization? Uh, to answer this question, we need to investigate folk songs, folk cult, and medieval sources describing the religion of the Slavs before its Christianization. Uh, here is one example of Ukrainian folk songs related to the cosmogony, and the two creators are presented in as uh, two birds. 
and the text is as follows. It was at the beginning of the world. Then there was no sky or earth, no sky nor earth, but the blue sea only. And in the middle of the sea, an oak. Uh, on oak, two pigeons were sitting, two pigeons on an oak tree. They heard such a council, uh, such a talk. Happy, debated and caught. How can we create the world? How uh, we will fall to the bottom of the sea. We will bring out the fine sand, fine sand, blue stone. We will sow fine sand. We will pick up the blue pebble from uh, fine sand, black earth, icy water, green grass from the blue stone, blue sky, blue sky, bright sun, bright sun, bright moon, bright moon, and the all stars. Such dualistic motif can be also found in 19th century folk arts. At the right, you can see a very popular motif in which, uh, in, in which is a tree of life, cosmic tree, and two creators, uh, also in the form of birds. Below is a medieval, medieval relief uh, from Croatia, from South Slavic region, that depicts the fight of a rider uh, on a horse and a dragon, a motif known from the myth just uh, discussed. And uh, here are also medieval clubs uh, for clothing, so uh, examples of Slavic Jeverly, uh, which also repeat this dualistic motif. Yes, you can see here person who sit uh, in the top and uh, some mythological being which is, which is down, uh, opposition of something uh, in, in, in sky and something in underworld. So here is also another archaic song from Ukraine with this motive. But uh, what pre-Christian gods were, however, the heroes of, of this story? And uh, this song is like, oh, as it was ages ago, oh, how there was no heaven and earth, and only it was a blue sea. There were fires on the sea, the signs. So here, another time we see Christian influence. The signs set around these fires, they advised who to send to the sea. Come on, Petro, to the uh, St. Peter, to the sea, uh, to the bottom. Get it, Petro, of yellow sound, uh, to spread all over the world. Heaven and the earth were born. The sky with the aurora. Aurora is, um, in Slavic language, is Zoria or Zoja, and it is the uh, morning light, which is coming with sunrise, and evening light, which is coming with uh, sunset, um, and uh, the earth with, with flowers. And uh, researchers who reconstruct the original version of the myth, uh, of this myth, indicate uh, two gods known quite well from early medieval sources, Perun, thunder god, and Veles, god of underworld, connected with a mythological dragon. Their cult was well described from, uh, for early medieval Kievan Rus, uh, where Perun was the god of warriors and Veles was the god of peasants and sorcerers. In medieval written sources, Perun, the thunderer, was described as a patron, patron of warriors and Veles as the god of poets, sorcerers, kettles and wealth. And here uh, I have, um, uh, here you can see etymological uh, look uh, on, on uh, these theonyms. Slavic uh, Perun comes from uh, old Slavic uh, language root per to hit, which is connected, for example, with contemporary Polish prać to hit. And it comes from Indo European perku, from which also, for example, uh, um, Lithuanian thunder god Perkunas uh, comes. Indo European perku, uh, from it uh, we have also uh, perku, uh, acorn. And from, from this root, we have, for example, Latin quercus, oak, and oak tree uh, among all Indo-Europeans was connected with thunder god. Celtic fergunia, mountain covered with forest, especially oak forest. 
Celtic Herkos, Oakwood, Gothic, so East German Fairguni Mountain, and it is connected with Indo-European Pei to heat and Indo-European Pher, Phor, be bright, and Indo-European Phu, being, speak, acting through sound. And this, uh, the last Indo-European root Phu uh, have also strong connotations uh, with, uh, with cosmogony as a being uh, of universe, of the whole universe. And therefore it is connected also with uh, Vedic Brahman, so Perun, uh, Theonym Perun can be, uh, can be explained and understood as the one who hits with thunder. Uh, here we have Slavic Grmeti, or all Ramble Pound, the one or the one who lives on the mountain. Uh, in uh, mythological reconstruction, Perun is the, the god who under the uh, as a white eagle or white horse live uh, in the top of the cosmic mountain, so near near the sky. And uh, Veles, Slavic uh, theonym Veles, uh, comes from pre-Indo-European well, dark, deep, wally, middle, dead to die. And uh, it's continuing um, uh, as uh, Oleg Trubachev proposed Indo-European uh, theonym Velhus, God of the Dead Ones, uh, which comes from Prindo-European root Tcholo, and from which we have uh, Slavic word Dol, Pit, Grave, Lowland, Wally, from which we have Polish, uh, contemporary Polish word Do, Down, something is, is, is in Down, yes? Coś jest na dole, something is uh, in Down. Um, Prindo-European Welch, be dead, and for example, Lithuanian Vele, the Kist, Old uh, Island uh, Val, Valr, the Kist, Old English Wal, the Kist, Old English Vales, Sea Monster from the Beowulf epic, Old Greek Velision, uh, Field Meadow, and for example, Latin Vales Meadow. Indo European Well, also connected Vel, also connected with uh, Theonym Veles, to see magically. Uh, and from it we have old uh, Orassian, old Rus uh, Wolf, sorcerer shaman, and old Norse Wilva, pro, uh, properties. Um, and it is also connected with very old Indo-European idea that uh, any magical force is connected to ability to see magically, to see the spirits, to see the, the spiritual part of the world. And also Slavic word uh, Wolst, Wolst uh, in, in Polish language Wosch, for example, uh, village, Slavic uh, Wols, her, uh, Slavic Vel, uh, well, wet, something is wet, uh, Slavic Vel, well, great big, and Slavic Velety, to want to order something. So Veles can be understood as uh, the one who is like the Wolle below, the one who sees keenly the one who can see magically, the one who is therefore the one who is a great sorcerer, and the one who commands uh, something, the one who wants something, the one who orders something. Um, and, uh, and here uh, we have the whole structure of Slavic dualistic mythology, which was very much inspired by Iranian dualistic worldview. The structure reconstructed by researchers shows a dually divided Slavic pantheon in which individual gods and goddesses were determini determined by their belonging to the heavenly uh, or underworld reality or to the third reality, which was the earth, the world beyond, uh, between, sorry, the world between uh, sky and the underworld. Uh, realities. What is very important, this dualism what no, was not understood as the opposition between God and uh, good and evil, uh, as a moral opposition, but as a harmonious complementation of uh, two opposing uh, aspects of, uh, of a nature, ultimately understood as uh, something which is reviving, uh, uh, a leaf connected with Perun, Dutch book, 
Svarok Jarovit and something what is dying, uh, something uh, that connected with Veles Dragon uh, in Old Slavic Zmei, Zmi, Morana, Winter Goddess, or for example, Baba Yaga, the goddess or, or who, who is between um, uh, world of living ones and dead ones. Uh, as a root of this dualism, at the root of this dualism was the concept of transformation. The transformation of non-being into being and being into non-being, chaos into cosmos and cosmos into chaos. It was a dynamic relationship between winter, sleep and death and night, uh, all the things like water, movement to the left and down, distant and underground world, strangeness, cold, dying, death, freezing water, the afterlife uh, understood as a wild and uh, untamed, uh, untamed sphere, forest, swamp, wale, magical wisdom, healing and ancestors. Uh, and summer life, uh, fire, movement upwards uh, and to the right, sky, uh, sky, stone, sky, heat, growth, fertility, power and social order, expression, realize of the life in the form of water, creation, stronghold, house, uh, confined space, center, especially center of the world, summer and uh, spring uh, connected with, uh, with, uh, with Perun, Dutchbok and, and other uh, haven. Uh, gods opposite to the underworld uh, gods. And the main idea was, of course, connected with the circulation of the life in nature and also with the seasons, with the dualism between the winter time of regeneration, of sleep, uh, of, uh, of chaos, and summer time of uh, life expression, of fertility. And uh, Mother Earth was in the middle of this dualism and she was the most important goddess of old Slavic pantheon and her cult was also very uh, good preserved among villagers still um, uh, in some regions till now, for example in Belarus or in Ukraine. Uh, Mother Earth was believed to be a leaf and fertile for half of the year during summer and spring and during second half of the year she used to sleep in uh, the underworld by the protection of Veles and uh, or mythological dragon who by sending the winter to the middle world used to give opportunity uh, for regeneration after harvests. There are folk relations that uh, during uh, the summer Mother Earth is fertilized by Perun, uh, by the thunder god, by thunders and rains, and, uh, and uh, at the autumn and uh, winter, after the grain is harvested, put to sleep by an underground deity who sprinkle her with poppy seeds. Uh, poppy seeds were, uh, were, were very much connected with, uh, with underworld and with ketonic sphere in Slavic mythology. And in many folk embroideries, we can see like on the photo presented here, the so-called goddess uh, who is surrounded by two male figures. And it is possible that these embroideries refer to, to this myth that the Mother Earth is between God of Sky connected with fertility and God of Underworld connected with death, winter, uh, and uh, understood as a regeneration after the um, agraric farm, farming uh, circle of, 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 of jobs, agraric works. Um, and uh, another possible trace of this myth is the tradition of tying a special bundle of cereals after the harvests uh, with an offerings and thanks to Mother Earth. It is here. Uh, who, who after the end of agricultural work in the autumn goes to sleep to be later in the spring awakened by Perun with the first spring um, thunderstorm. <clears throat> Photo at the right uh, present uh, such uh, bentle. And here is also a very beautiful song from the Belarus uh, dedicated to, to Mother Earth. Earth, our dear mother, we came to bow you, bow to you, share with our song. You gave us uh, uh, water, you feed us, 
what would be what it uh, be without you our small houses like orphans and we little children like souls from nowhere and uh, between sky and <clears throat> underworld towards the reconstruction of cosmology when we have discussed uh, cosmogony how the world was created and how it uh, functions how it works uh, it is also worth looking at the cosmology namely these beliefs about the construction and the structure of the world how the mythological world looks like and uh, the oldest objects uh, related to the cosmology came from the middle ages from archaeological research they were among uh, uh, they they were among others the clips um, shown above in the context of, of, of dualistic cosmology <clears throat> but the most accurate and uh, the largest model of the um, ancient slavic cosmos is the statue found in the mid 19th century in this Bruch river in uh, today's ukraine um, the left uh, photo here uh, uh, sorry the left photo here and the right photo here um, uh, presents uh, this uh, particular uh, statue and as you can see uh, it shows the division into three spheres of slavic universe uh, haven which is here um, connected uh, represented by two female uh, figures and uh, two male figures they are probably some divine figures uh, but what exactly we do not know middle world represented here uh, uh, as an earth uh, is depicted through the circle of dancing people uh, and the underworld which is here is depicted by the Veles, who according to mythological reconstructions was associated with the number three uh, and uh, also as a free headed dragon all uh, with a special name uh, Triglav the one who has three uh, free heads yes the three heads one we can translate it so uh, this is the reason why Veles underworld uh, got uh, have here this this three forms uh, this cosmological tripartition can be also found in a bronze item from Stargard Pagreiski and uh, it is related to the West Slavic Polabians. Um, what is very interesting, um, there are animals uh, here and here uh, between uh, be between humans and heaven and underworld, probably as uh, sacrifices or mediators between divine spheres uh, and human sphere. Uh, the same idea has been preserved in, uh, in a folklore. In traditional art and songs, uh, the world is depicted as three spheres around the tree of life, around the cosmic tree. It is very important uh, in uh, the ritual calendar to recall uh, these cosmological images in the spring when the world uh, was believed to be reborn after the winter. Social, special, special processions were held with the image of tree of life, a cosmic tree growing in the middle of the mythological world. Um, during them, songs related to making wishes were sung. Uh, among these songs motif of the cosmic tree the center of the universe which grows near the host house is a very popular motif those uh, parallelism uh, is visible between the mythological center which is the cosmic tree and the social center which is the host house sometimes the same ritual was made with the usage of sand paintings uh, here are two examples of such songs and here is also sand painting from the uh, region uh, of uh, uh, Kujawy. It is in contemporary northern Poland, uh, image of, of uh, cosmic tree. And uh, according to tradition, uh, people used to uh, make these uh, sand paintings in the spring to call fertility powers and to call this uh, this uh, life power which comes from um, uh, cosmic tree 
and here is a procession spring procession with gaik with the matri um, made uh, by young girls uh, from the house to the house with the special songs and uh, these two songs one is from poland second is from ukraine uh, dear pigeons are flying flying give us our green wine they are carrying through uh, two oaks uh, they dropped at the host gate good people planted it two oaks are growing growing golden leaves on this oaks silver dew on these leaves uh, what is for example interesting uh, motif of uh, golden leaves and silver dew on the cosmic tree can be also found in Scandinavian mythology in the image of Yggdrasil, um, the, the cosmic tree. So here we can see that we have a very, very old Indo-European idea uh, connected with, with gold and uh, with silver and also with the morning dew as the symbol of uh, fertility and uh, fertile powers of, um, of the earth. And here, second song, very interesting also, and at the host house uh, was uh, built, the house is built, the sycamore tree is planted, falcons sit in the sycamore crown, bees fly by the sycamore trunk in the roots of the sycamore black beavers. So here we can see that three worlds, sky, earth and the underworld, are uh, represented by three Mm, uh, three special animals. Uh, falcons are the symbol of the sun, bees are the symbol of the humanity. Uh, it is, for example, very popular motif, not only among Slavic peoples, but also among uh, Baltic peoples, that uh, humanity will exist so long as uh, on, on this earth bees will, uh, will be with us. Um, this parallelism between bees and, and uh, humanity is very, very strong uh, for, uh, for Balto-Slavic tradition. And uh, the black beavers, which represent Veles and underworld. And uh, black beavers were also connect connected with magical practices, with sorcery and with uh, cult of cult of ancestors. And going to the end of my presentation, I would like to mention a few more uh, important points connected with the reconstruction of old Slavic beliefs. Today I couldn't tell you about everything. I focused mainly on the history of the Slavs uh, to present you who the Slavic peoples were, from uh, what region of, of Europe they came from, and uh, their connections with other Indo-Europeans. Uh, and uh, on two basic myths with the intention of showing some very basic information about our ancestors. So uh, first of all, it should be emphasized that the cosmogonic myth presented uh, both, cosmogonic myth uh, of, of the diving and cosmogonic myth of, of uh, cosmic egg and fight between thunder god and uh, dragon, uh, was a cyclical and agrarian myth. It was closely related to the circle um, of agriculture uh, work and seasons that was repeated every year. Slavic peoples did not perceive time linearly as a line, but uh, cyclically as a cycle, as a circle uh, which, which turns uh, non-stop. Time was believed to be a circle and uh, therefore Myths also were cyclical. Uh, every autumn and winter, time when Mother Earth sleep in the underworld, was connected with the domination of ketonic deities. Every spring thunderstorm repeated the uh, mythical battle that took place at the beginning of the world between Perun and uh, the dragon. Uh, agriculture works were present uh, in the background of the smith as its very foundation. Sowing and plowing um, were associated with Perun, harvesting of cereals with the cult of the sun, and the time uh, after the harvest with Veles under uh, God of Underworld. The cult of Mother Earth was at the center of the myth. Another uh, so here we have this cyclical uh, nature of mythology and agrarian farming uh, type of religion. 
Another very important element of Slavic beliefs was the cult of ancestors. Several special rituals were celebrated during the year, during which the souls of the ancestors were invited to the fires and to the table um, in the house uh, to feast together with the families. It was believed that after death, the souls of ancestors go to the underworld under the protection of Veles. There were also beliefs in reincarnation associated with the migrations of birds. It was believed that after death, a part of some aspects of the human soul is taken in the, uh, in the fall by birds departing to warmlands. The mythical uh, land to which the birds and their souls flew was called uh, Virai, Ptasi Virai, so Virai of the birds. The spring return of uh, returning of migratory birds, especially storks, was associated with the rebirth of the souls and the fertility and the life in the world, and of course connected with spring. The cult of ancestors was uh, very, very important in this context. Folklore has kept uh, the so-called jade tradition, which can be translated in the English as the grandfathers. The ritual was also known as Zadushki. In English, we can translate it for souls. Uh, the oldest men in the family used to call upon the ancestral spirits and summon them to the table in the central part of the house and left them food overnight and uh, burning fire to keep them uh, warm. Uh, the, cult, uh, the cult of uh, uh, ancestral souls was associated with the autumn and winter periods when, as we remember, the Catonic, uh, Catonic god Veles, god Veles, uh, who patronized them, uh, dominate, is dominating the earth during winter and, uh, and autumn. Another essential core uh, of the of the Slavic and uh, also Baltic religion is the so-called parallelism, um, man and nature parallelism in folklore texts. In folk songs, the motif of combining the phenomena of social and mental life with the phenomena of the natural world was very very popular. The wedding for example, is generally described in songs as a love between two trees, uh, Viburnum and Sycamore. sycamore. Uh, Viburnum is a, a, a woman and a Sycamore is a man. Or two birds, Falcon and the Cuckoo. The bride who goes to the wedding is like uh, the setting sun and the groom who goes to her is like the moon. Sun goddess and the moon god are like bride and groom in these songs. Uh, so we can see the idea of um, creating some connection between uh, this what is happening among people and this what is happening instead of myth um, among the, the celestial bodies, uh, among the gods in, in heaven. Uh, researchers believe that this is a trace of animistic beliefs according to which every man or woman, depending on age and social position, had its own parallel uh, in the world of nature as a form of birth, uh, tree or, or, or some celestial body. In some songs, we can also find the so-called motif of heavenly family, a parallel uh, to the human family. The sun is the wife hostess, the moon is the husband host, and the evening Zarya Zoja. In English, it should be uh, Aurora, Aurora, but not Borealis Aurora from the very top north, but evening Aurora or morning Aurora, light in the sky during uh, sunset or um, or, or uh, on every on early morning. I also talked about it a uh, moment ago, are uh, their daughters. In other variants, the sun and the moon are two men and who are in love in this Zarya Zaryanica, uh, and uh, she is uh, their mistress. Other songs mentioned uh, three friends who used to visit people and help them. 
the sun, the moon, and the little rain. And the photos uh, at the bottom are medieval feminine Jeberli from Kievan Rus in uh, form of, uh, and here is another time, this form of two birds, which can be related to the cosmogonical myth about Peron and uh, Veles. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, it was a very great honor for me and uh, I'm very happy to, to, to have possibility of sharing with you Slavic traditions. If you are interested in, um, in the Slavic tradition, you can contact with me by uh, my uh, Gmail, which is uh, here. And uh, the last photo came from Polish uh, village Zalipie. And here uh, uh, we can see mythological paintings and also, uh, as uh, before mentioned, um, uh, cosmic tree, tree of life, divided into three spheres with the birds uh, on the two sides. So we can, we can, and this photo comes from 1976, so we can find that some motifs uh, were, were very good preserved among the village people. At, uh, on the last, uh, I looked for some literature in English about Slavic traditions and mythology. So if you are interested in uh, making some research on it, here is uh, this literature that I found in English. Especially interesting is uh, scientific magazine Studia Mythologica Slavica, uh, in which you can find a lot of uh, many interesting articles. There are also uh, some comparatistic research uh, and articles uh, on the relation between Slavic tradition and ancient uh, Hindu tradition. So I think that it would be very interesting for, for you. So. Thank you once more, and uh, I think that we can open a session of, of questions and uh, answers. Thank you, Mr. Mokola. Uh, Mokola. I asked Surendra Mathurji. Surendraji, are you there, Surendra Mathurji? Yeah, I'm here very much. Okay, okay. <laughs> now we can continue for question and answer. Uh, Mr. Mikola, you can uh, stop screen sharing. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Is there any question we can ask? Uh, but you have to ask in English. Thank you so much, Mr. Mikola. I enjoyed every bit of your presentation. And uh, most of the things uh, I was absolutely unaware of. So it was a very great surprise to me that your Slavic uh, culture uh, is so close to our own culture. If you have been to India and you, if you have visited our cities and villages, you would have find a number of similarities. However, my questions are slightly different. First question is that you know Christianity, uh, it has no culture. Your winter, winter solstice has been converted to uh, your, your Christmas. So it is all the old traditions that have been copied, imitated, or, or uh, continued, uh, or somehow managed by the Christians. So one way is that when you use uh, the term mythology for your own culture, your own history, or your own uh, religion, I think uh, we should not use this mythology. That mythology means false. So why should we call ourselves, our culture false when we are so proud of our past and uh, our past has celebrated diversity, whereas Christianity is monotheism, there is no scope of differences. They cannot tolerate difference at all. A Christian from Australia and a Christian from Canada carry the same thing, similar. If 1% difference, that also cannot be tolerated. 
so that is my suggestion and moreover i am very very happy that you have used brahman you have used shraman these words and you have said mother earth that we call in india dharti mata so everything appeared so close to us even i found the sign of that swastik on your clothes belt when you were explaining and that sign has been copied as cross uh, in christianity cross is not cross because there was no jesus so there was no cross there was no death no sin no resurrection so this has been all created and uh, i am so happy to learn that you have worked so hard on this area and uh, so many uh, links also you have shared with us uh, magazines and journals i will certainly uh, explore much about your area and uh, but now one question is that how is now your 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 past i mean whether people want to revive those cultures or they are happy with whatever they have or um, uh, i mean i don't know uh, but uh, uh, is, is there any curiosity among the people uh, so if you can throw some light on that thank you so much thank you so much i also thank you very much uh, for for these words and uh, uh, answering to your question like now in slavic countries for uh, for um, with the awakening of uh, slavic national identity in the 19th century many uh, researchers people and uh, uh, who 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 wanted to Uh, built this national identity were looking for the village origins and village culture and about 200 years ago um, a very strong movement of um, revive, reviving slavic religion slavic culture and uh, this primary uh, slavic spirituality was uh, was very very popular and till now in many slavic i think in all slavic countries Uh, there are a lot of organizations even official uh, religious organizations which are uh, reviving old slavic religions uh, here in poland also we have uh, four such big organization which uh, in in which are about uh, 5000 people totally i think and also for last 10 years 20 years i think maybe Uh, in the wave of uh, some uh, fantasy books and uh, many things from the popular culture um, the idea of slavic identity of our past connected with slavic origins is going to be more and more popular in poland even some sociologists uh, some people used to talk about uh, slavic revival or Uh, slavic uh, spring uh, in the in the europe also in ukraine in belarus in russia in other countries it is very very popular to go back to uh, to these roots and even uh, revive old religion um, through singing songs organizing celebrations uh, traditional weddings rituals and and things like that and this movement is growing from the year uh, to year and is becoming more and more strong uh, in all slavic countries like now uh, thank you very much mr mikola i want to make one observation main ek jo baat maine mehsoos ki hai kuch baatein to dr sailendra ji ne bata di bahut acche se explain kar diya ki jo similarity dikh rahi hai ek similarity jo mujhe dhyan mein aayi wo main thoda batana cha raha tha मुझे लगता है वह जो एक कॉस्मोलॉजी को आप इंटरप्रेट कर रहे थे दो बर्ड्स टू बर्ड्स वर देयर तो अपने ऋग्वेद में एक मंत्र आता है द्वासपूर्णा सयुजा सखाया समानम वृक्षम परिशस्व जाते और वो कहता है कि एक वृक्ष है जिसको हम प्रकृति कहते हैं और उस पर दो पक्षी हैं देर आर टू बर्ड्स ऑन ए ट्री द ट्री इज प्रकृति द नेचर और दो बर्ड्स जो है वो एक जीव है और दूसरा ईश्वर है तो मुझे उसमें भी बड़ा बड़ी समानता दिख रही थी बहुत सारी चीजों में जब आपने ब्लू का ये सी की बात की 
जिसको अंत समुद्र की बात करते हैं हम वेदों में समुद्र का अर्थ अंतरिक्ष होता है और वहां पर नासदी सुक्ता पढ़ेंगे तो आपको देखेंगे कि वहां कुछ नहीं था और उसी की बात हम कर रहे हैं तो पूरी कॉस्मोलॉजी एक तरीके से मैं वो सुनते समय लग रहा था वैदिक कॉस्मोलॉजी ही मैं सुन रहा हूँ मुझे बड़ा अच्छा लग रहा था तो उसके लिए मैं एक बार धन्यवाद करता हूँ सुरेंद्र जी आप इसको कुछ और बढ़ाएंगे तो बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद मुझे तो बहुत ही आनंद आता है इनसे बात करके जी जी आई एंजॉय टॉकिंग टू हेम एंड वी आर फ्रिक्वेंटली मीटिंग आई एम वेरी ग्रेटफुल टू हेम वी आर मॉनिटरिंग डे टू डे फेस्टिवल्स विद हेम एंड वी फाउंड दैट एवरी फेस्टिवल ऑफ डेज इज मैचिंग विद आवर फेस्टिवल you know the the method of celebration is matching many of them the names are coming out in sanskrit of course uh, uh, only difference is that because we have been separated for many many years so many we are years. have we have very very yes many many long years so we are not in touch but now this is this group is now interacting with slavic we have made so that's a wonderful feeling that we both we feel that they are our family we are one family and we talk to many slavic elders now uh, from different countries we are meeting them and now they are also feeling that india is very much their own you know the hindus are their own and that's all that's all the feeling i would like mikula to speak up just for a minute how do you feel with our uh, routine interaction what feeling do you have just just a minute to everybody so uh, for near a year uh, we used to meet every sunday with surendra and look for the similarities and uh, as we discussed this idea of hindu slavic cooperation in our circle we we found that uh, we are like brothers and, and sisters from this indo european family and Uh, you know some names sometimes are not the same some things in some details are not the same but the whole idea the whole structure of uh, symbols of that how our ancestors uh, were looking for the reality for the um, uh, for the whole universe is the same so this is the same energy that we are sharing between ourselves and uh, when we are going deeper and deeper in our um comparatistic work uh, we on the slavic side <laughs> uh, feel uh, this this uh, connection with india very very strong and i'm hope that that this side, that this cooperation will uh, will be uh, further and deeper and also if you are interested you can join our meetings with surendra uh, in uh, in every sunday you can uh, you, you you can surrender uh, say a, a little bit more about these meetings and maybe maybe your friends will be also interested to, to, yeah. to come yeah. okay thank you very much this is what i wanted to tell everybody this is not one day's work this is not your just presentation it is the confidence and the feeling of brotherhood that we have developed in last so many years and the, my first meeting was uh, uh, with you and also with, with the Uh, mariana from zek republic and many more people from ukraine now this uh, this relationship is becoming more stronger and stronger and uh, we are now going into the details of each and every festival so thank you very much mikula and i think you can wind up thank you so much i am also very grateful namaste 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 ये व्याख्यान समाप्त होता है इस कार्यक्रम को समाप्ति की घोषणा करता हूँ धन्यवाद धन्यवाद